Chapter Twelve of Dave Dawson on Guadalcanal by Robert Sidney Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Helpless Heroes. A brief moment of tingling silence seemed to hover in the air right after the Nazi U-boat commander stopped speaking. Then the Jap made more of his punctured tire hissing sound and bobbed his head violently. Yes, a very good plan, Herr Commandant, he said, in the other's tongue. I myself will fly them to the illustrious Admiral's ship and obey his commands. He will learn all there is to learn, I can promise you. There is no one in all Japan so clever as the Honorable Admiral, and tonight he will receive you with praise. That I can promise, too. I often heard it said that he admires you most of all your countrymen, your Honorable Fuhrer has sent to assist us. This last statement was proof that the slant-eyed Jap was no dope. He knew how to soft-soap the Nazi squarehead type, and the feeling of uneasiness in Dawson increased considerably. He half wished the Nazi would change his mind and decide to keep Freddy and him prisoners aboard the U-boat. There was something in the Jap's face that didn't make him feel even a little satisfied. On the contrary, he wondered plenty if the Jap would fly them to Sasebo's ship. Neither Freddy nor himself had sold the Jap a thing, as they had the Nazi. Ten to one, the son of Nippon secretly regarded them as just two humans to slaughter at will, and with much pleasure. And so stealing himself inwardly, and bearing down hard to keep any of his feelings from showing on his face, Dave waited for the next move in this game of life and death, in which those favoring death had most of the chips. I am honored to learn that your honorable admiral thinks so highly of me, the Nazi said, as his chefs puffed out a little. And the feeling is mutual, I assure you. Good, then. You will fly these two to the admiral, and we will meet again tonight. Well? The Nazi paused, frowned at his wristwatch, and then nodded. In an hour, he said, looking back at the Jap, we will run submerged for an hour longer. Then we will surface, and if all is well, we will launch the plane. In the meantime, you can lock them up forward. They will be safe, if not comfortable, in that empty store's compartment forward. Lock them up, and then come back and join me in an officer's toast to your emperor and to my fuhrer. The Jap beamed like a joyful rattlesnake and made a stiff, jerky bow from the waist. Then he quickly became the very, very tough little guy. He waved his gun at Dawson and Freddy and screamed an order. Go outside, dogs. We have no further use for you. Go outside in the direction I order. Move before I shoot you where you stand. The Jap spoke in English that time, and so with a forced look of bewilderment on his face, Dawson turned and led the way out into the companionway. Perhaps Freddy took just a little too long to follow. Anyway, Dave heard the slap of the Jap's gun against his pal's head, and a split second later, the English youth stumbled against him in a desperate effort to remain on his feet. He succeeded, and a few minutes later they were shoved through a door into pitch darkness. The door was clanged shut behind, and the rasping sound of the twisting lock key grated on their ears. "'You hurt bad, Freddy?' Dave asked anxiously, as he stood motionless in the dark. "'Fancy I'll survive,' Freddy replied bitterly. "'That dirty beggar, man. I never thought I'd be able to enjoy killing a man.' but I'm sure I'd enjoy killing that filthy swine. After me, you come next, Dave said grimly, and started putting one foot cautiously in front of the other. I guess this place is empty, so we might as well sit on the deck and try to be comfortable. Come over here, Freddy. We can use this bulkhead wall for a backrest. We are in a jam, Freddy. The English-born ace didn't speak until both of them were sitting on the smooth steel deck and were leaning back against the bulkhead wall. Then he sighed and groaned softly. Quite, he muttered. 
A blasted awful mess, too. It makes me ill to think of what they said. Man, Dave, the blighters know about our plans to attack Guadalcanal. I thought I'd choke when I heard that. That's bad, you know, Dave. You're telling me, son, Dawson echoed. It's worse than that. But it doesn't help much to groan about it. What worries me is what's going to happen when that ten-cent Jap dumps us in Suicide Sasebo's lap. We had that thick-headed Nazi believe in us about our forces being way up north. I thought for a moment, that is, I hoped that. Aw, oh, nuts. We couldn't hope to work a break that good. We may yet, Freddy Farmer remarked, after a long moment of silence. If we could only just get this Sasebo to believe that there is nothing south of him, and that all our naval and air forces are way up north, and about to strike at Japan direct, then... The English youth suddenly seemed to realize he was reaching for stars, and let the rest trail off in the silence. And get him to change his plans, and go highballing with his whole force north for another one of his pet suicide ventures? Dave more or less finished for him. Sure, pal, that would be tops. It would be almost as good as if we could dive right out through these steel plates and swim to the Carson and tell Admiral Jackson the exact location of suicide's force moving south. Yes, absolutely, Freddy grunted. Then after a slight pause, he added, and the truth of the matter is that I could tell Admiral Jackson where Sasebo's force is, if I could get to him. Dawson gasped, choked, and gaped toward his pal in the pitch darkness. Oh, pal, he cried, that cloud on ahead did send you spinning. Take it easy, kid. Take it easy, nothing, Freddy replied hotly. I could, Dave. And if you'd use your eyes, you'd have learned what I did. The location of Suicide's force? Dawson asked incredulously. Exactly, Freddy told him firmly. At least what it was at ten o'clock this morning. It was 140 degrees west and five degrees north. I saw the position marked on the desk chart in that Nazi's cabin. And do you know what that means, Dave? Well, I'll be a bow-legged son of a gun, Dave gulped out in awed admiration. Kid bright eyes to the rescue again. Boy, I sure hand it to you when it comes to coming through in the clinches. Just like that, he learns what Admiral Jackson's whole force wants to know. Holy smokes! And a lot of good it does me to know. Locked up in this blasted steel closet, Freddy Farmer groaned. But I asked you, do you know what that means? Do you happen to know where 140 West and 5 North happens to be? Huh, Dawson echoed, where? I noticed it on the chart, of course, Freddy replied. It happens to be a good hundred miles west of the area our planes have been searching. In other words, Colonel Welsh and Admiral Jackson are not going to find the Japs in the area they're searching. Sasebo is well west of them, so he didn't go south as was reported. He moved west from truck almost five hundred miles and then turned south. As of ten o'clock this morning, he was heading for Jap-held New Guinea and... Jumping jeepers, Dave broke in with a gasp. So that's it. He's going to slip through between New Guinea and New Britain and catch our attacking force on Guadalcanal from the south. Cut our supply lines to shreds and then follow through with a main attack on whatever our boys have gained. Good night. That'll be a heck of a note, Freddy. Quite and definitely, the English youth replied, with a faint tremor in his voice. Either that, or he'll go all the way around the western end of New Guinea and split his forces. Have to cut off our forces on Guadalcanal, and have to make a sea and air attack against perhaps Darwin, on the northern side of Australia. Who knows what that cunning devil has up his sleeve? And to think we know where his confounded force is, man, I could shoot myself in despair. Here, cut that out, pal, Dave snapped. Get that old chin up. We're still alive, and that's something. You wouldn't care to tell me how much, would you? The English youth grunted. 
No, I guess not, Dawson said with a chuckle. But you get the idea just the same. Boy, oh boy, if we only could get word to Colonel Welsh and Admiral Jackson. Darn it, Freddy. We've got to somehow. We've just got to. No doubt of it, Freddy mumbled gloomily in the darkness. But how? That's the stickler, old thing. How? I don't know, Dawson murmured. But maybe we'll get some kind of a break. If we don't, we'll just have to make one, that's all. This Jap rat who shot us down. I wonder how he figures to fly us to suicide's force. That one is easy, Freddy Farmer sighed. You'll see, tied hand and foot, and jammed down into the rear pit of that seaplane, like a couple of sardines, I fancy. No, I don't think I'm looking forward to that particular airplane ride. Yeah, like a couple of helpless sardines, probably, Dave murmured. Yes, I guess I can think of more comfortable flights I've had, too. Oh, well, a guy can always hope. And with that listless comment, Dave lapsed into brooding silence, and Freddy Farmer joined him. For quite some time, neither of them spoke. What was there to say anyway? And what was there to say that hadn't already been spoken? Absolutely nothing. And so it was better just to sit and keep one's thoughts to oneself. What the future would bring, it would bring, and that was that. After a long, long spell of mutual silence, a sudden change in the movement of the U-boat told them both that the undersea craft was going up to the surface. Dawson grunted and sat up a little straighter. Up we go, he grunted, so things will be happening soon. Can't say I'd be mad if said things were bombs dropping on this thing from a chance plane or two of ours, Freddy Farmer growled. The way I feel right now, I don't think I'd mind at all. Oh, blast it. I guess that gun slap from the Jap, Rotter, did something to my nerve. I feel in an awful funk, Dave. Swell, perfect, pal, Dave said with a chuckle. Keep right on feeling that way, and everything will be okay. Not much it will, the English youth grated. And what the deuce do you mean by that crack anyway? I mean that I've seen you like this before and plenty, Dawson told him, and squeezed his arm in the darkness. And those other times, you just hauled back and knocked him high, wide, and handsome. So it's okay by me, kid, very much okay. You'll get us some action if I don't. Thanks, old thing, Freddy said, with a faint huskiness in his voice. And I'm a rotter to try and drag you down, too. Sorry, no end, Dave. I'll try and buck up and not be such a wet whack. Wet smack, Dave corrected with a laugh. Holy smokes, aren't you ever going to learn to speak the language, huh? The English youth grunted, but before he could make any reply to that, there came the final lurching motion as the U-boat broke surface, and even in their steel-walled prison they could hear the sounds of feverish activity. A moment or two later, they could tell that the U-boat was motionless on the surface, and then more sounds, the wind and grind of turning gears, caused them to guess that the small seaplane was being hoisted up out of its hold hangar. Suddenly, Dave began to chuckle softly, and Freddy Farmer peered at him in the darkness. What's wrong with you, Dave, he asked. What's so blasted funny? I was just thinking, Dawson replied. Remember that stuffed shirt ground major at the Broom Airfield in Australia? The one whose feet you dusted off with the prop wash of the plane? The English youth echoed. Yes, I remember him. What about him? I was just thinking, Dave said. Maybe I gave that chump the right tip after all. Maybe he went dancing into a CO's office with a real dope and got tossed out for passing around such a cockeyed rumor. Yes, maybe you did at that, Freddy Farmer said soberly. If Suicide Sasebo does strike at Australia, you will have given the tip off days in advance, only you didn't know it. But I can't see anything to laugh about. Okay, sober sides, I guess you're right, Dawson muttered but I sure could do with a good laugh right about now. I, oh, oh, 
I suspect here comes company. Watch it, Freddy, and hang on hard, pal. Right, oh, Dave, the English youth breathed. Be right in there with you, old thing. Freddy had hardly gotten the words off his lips when a key grated in the door lock and the door was kicked open with a crash. Pale light instantly poured into the room, and for a moment Dave and Freddy could see only blurred silhouettes in the companionway outside. Presently their eyes focused to the change of light, and they saw the Jap naval officer and two Jap seamen leering at them. The officer was dressed for flying. In his hand he carried his ever-present gun, and each of the sailors carried a coil of thin, tough line. Turn around and face the other way, the Jap officer suddenly hissed at them. For a split second, the two youths hesitated as red waves of rebellion surged up in them. But in that same split second, they realized that any show of resistance would be the same as putting a gun to their heads and pulling the trigger. They were as helpless as a couple of caged sparrows, and to do anything about it would be plain downright stupidity. And so they slowly turned around and suffered themselves to be trussed up hand and foot by the two Jap sailors. And suffer they did, in every sense of the word. It was a joy to those sons of heathens to have the opportunity to tie up two white men, and they went about their task with savage glee. And the Jap officer, standing to one side with his gun ready, took almost as much joy in the operations as they did. For Dawson and Freddy Farmer, it was terrible torture to both mind and soul. The loops of the thin, tough line were yanked so tight that they felt like cords of white fire burning into their flesh. Then long before the two Jap seamen had completed the job, the feeling of burning bands of white fire disappeared. There was just a dull, throbbing numbness in their legs and in their arms. And as the final fiendish touch, the end of the line was looped about their necks and drawn back tight and tied, so that every time they moved their heads, the loop bit into their throat and choked off their wind. Finally, through the pounding in his ears, Dawson heard the Jap officer scream something in his native tongue. Then he felt himself being lifted up and slung across one of the Jap's shoulders like a sack of wet meal. And he could not keep track of just exactly what happened after that. All the bombs in the world were exploding in his brain. His lungs were on fire, and his thumping heart was pounding its way out through his ribs. He seemed to lose control of the movement of his eyeballs. They kept rolling back up into his brain, and vision was impossible. Everything was just a surging ocean of red waves. In a crazy, abstract sort of way, he wondered if he had lost consciousness. He decided he hadn't. Otherwise, he wouldn't be thinking such a jumble of thoughts. Then suddenly, instinct told him he was falling. He tried to cry out in alarm, but there was no sound of his own voice in his ringing ears. There was just a wild, angry jabbering of Japanese. A tiny thought whipped through his brain to tell him that his Jap seaman had missed his footing and was lunging downward, and the instinct of self-preservation caused him to strain at his bonds. And that was the very last thing he remembered. The whole world blew up in that instant, and he went sailing off into a great void of utter silence and darkness. End of chapter 12